Uh, welcome, golfers. Kevin Haim here. And Jake Haim here. Time for some better golf. Uh, podcast episode 19, Jake. What's on your mind today? Lots, lots. Let's get right into it, actually. Yeah, you know what? Uh, we had a big week last week at the Honda. We've got Paul Lazinger opening his yap about how the PGA Tour is the place to be. We've got Peter Costas talking about um, how CBS uh, TV coverage needs help. And, and I think we want to talk about that a little bit today. We've got Tommy Fleetwood rinsing his ball on 18. I love his action. I want to look at his action and teach people something with that today. Uh, That's quite the way to set it up. He rinsed his ball. Let's talk about his action. Well, he did, and someone yelled in his backswing. But yeah, I love, I love his move. Well, you know what? You can talk about a little bit how Paul Azinger is saying that he succumbed to the pressure, and I might have a comment as to whether he did or not. So we'll talk about that. But I love Fleetwood's action. I do want to break down a couple of things he does really well yeah, in that's it great. to help our listeners and viewers. And I've got a favorite teaching aid I want to get to today, and I've got a club fitting tip. I want to get to today. So there's all kinds of stuff. And I think we also talked about doing stats, right? We're going to uh, help people out with a stat every episode and, and what, how we can help and what they can learn from it. For what, sure. What do you want to start with? I think let's, I mean, we already started kind of mentioning Fleetwood. So let's get in right in on it. Let's get right in on it. All right. What's your comment on 18? Did he choke? Uh, I don't know. I'd use the word choke. I think he hit a bad shot. You know, I think that uh, Tommy Fleetwood does have a bit of a history of not doing great in final rounds. A PGA Tour event, you know, I, I don't think what Azinger said about that tour as the European Tour being very fair, but I do think that there is something there that Tommy probably feels some pressure about succeeding in America. He has come out and said that if you want to be one of the best players in the world, you have to do so in the states. Um, but no, I just think he was playing to win, which I respect, and he had a bad shot. I don't think he choked necessarily. Yeah, I, I thought he was trying to hit the ball a little too far. So from my perspective as a golf pro, first of all, the guy was incredible in the Ryder Cup. He, he, you know, he's been a dominant force in Europe, raced to Dubai, a l- lot of wins. Well, he's I come can- second in two U.S. Opens. And shoot, shot 63, so he, I think, at Shinnecock yeah. on Sunday. Yes. So to say he doesn't do well in, in final rounds, like the, the guy can really swing the club and can really play. So let me clarify. He hasn't done maybe his best performance when he's in the lead going into a final round. And that's just, it is hard to win. It just hasn't happened for him yet. He's only played 64 tour events. Yeah. So it's not like he's had this giant depth and those 64 tour events are all the best events because he doesn't play in the dogs, right? Yeah, everyone's career is defined by little moments of greatness or failure. Scott Hoke famously missed the putt in the playoff with Nick Faldo at the Masters. He'll always be remembered for that. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood did hit the ball in the water, but the water is 30 feet right of the pin, and he was trying to hit a 280-yard something shot, and he might have got a little out in front of it, left the face That's a little saying. bit That's what I'm saying. He just open. hit a slightly bad shot. I don't think he was Yeah, not choke. even a bad, choky shot. Um, anyway, I love his action. I wanted to help people a little bit. The, the thing I like the most about Tommy Fleetwood's action, Jake, is his takeaway. And uh, he does what Tiger Woods does. Those two have this in common in that their swing away from the golf ball is so neutral and quiet and dominated by the upper body. He keeps the club in front of him, and it's in perfect position. It also leads for width and a bigger golf swing. So what I mean by that is that as he swings that golf club back, he keeps both arms extended. I don't like to say straight because that infers a little bit of tension, but he keeps them extended, and he just turns his chest and swings his arms and that maintains the size of that big triangle formed by his arms and chest and makes his golf swing as big and as neutral as it can be. It also keeps the club out in front of him, uh, which is so important. If you look at Tommy at waist high, he's probably, and we actually have a photo up on our big screen behind us. Yeah, here. He, he, happened he to be probably has, when his hands are reaching his belly button, 70 degrees of shoulder rotation already. He's turning into his right hip. The weight's moving onto the right foot. It's a very wide rotational takeaway, and it's just fantastic in my estimation. It's a great tenant of good ball striking, right? I mean, that's where the comparison to Tiger is so strong. Tiger's arguably best thing about his golf game, apart from his mental game, is his incredible distance control and aptitude with his irons, right? And when you rotate your chest that much early, it allows you to have very passive hands and allows you to be a very big muscle. And that's incredibly good for hitting crisp iron shots because there's not a lot of flipping at impact, right? And that's where, you well, know. Well, how about no flipping at impact ever 
is a is what you want to do. You know what what people can learn from it, and what we see on the lesson tee all the time. If people want to play better mm-hmm. golf, they've got to stop pulling the club away from the ball. And and the big check for me, everyone, when they're practicing next time, is as the club swings back. If they're trailing arm, so the right arm for most players, for the right handers, uh, when they swing back, if it starts to bend immediately, that's telling you you're not turning your chest enough. You need to turn your chest as you swing the club. That keeps the club in front of you in the proper position to set it at the top. And through impact, it's going to tend to be more in front of you. So Tommy does an incredible job uh, maintaining that. The other thing I like about Tommy's swing is through impact, he rotates his lower body, clears incredibly well. Uh, You can see it in, you know, go to YouTube and look up some swing sequences. There's some video footage of Tommy. His hips are really cleared through impact. I don't have an exact number because we've never had him in our gear studio, but he's got to be in the 50 to 60 degree open. So it's a very rotational wide swing and people can learn a ton from that. If, if they, you know, higher handicappers, more the takeaway, try to get those elements going better players. You got to get to that lead leg into your downswing, but you've got to clear those hips and get rotational on it. Right, Jake, Jake, not slide them kind of towards the target too much so I love his action he's a ball striker's ball striker it's only a matter of time uh I just didn't think that shot was that terrible now Mackenzie Hughes our fellow Canadian hit a terrible shot in eight yeah that shot was way worse so he did what you said the flipping of the hands he kind of you know was a little tentative and he, he I think he did on 16 too with a three wood into the was it which where, where did he hit the iron I, or maybe a four iron on 16 and then whatever he hit on 18, but he flipped and the ball went way left. And that's that's not hitting with assertiveness, and it's kind of decelerating the body, and the hands take over and the club closes, right? So Yeah, so so just to explain to everybody what we mean by turning through and why it would cause the hand to flip, it, it should make some sort of sense. If you don't rotate your body enough through the golf ball, you don't clear is the term that we use, your arms aren't going to get to the ball fast enough. So if your body's not rotating and forcing the hands in front of you into position, you have to get the club there somehow, and your hands are going to take over and flip the club forward. The club head is going to pass your hands, and you essentially flip your hands. Close the face. It tends to close the face, right? Whereas well, it's interesting, Jake, as we all do that subconsciously. I think listeners can kind of understand that a little bit, or maybe they don't understand it, but when your body's in the way, you subconsciously square that club face with forearms, wrists, yeah, and else hands. You, you, you miss shut the ball, down, right? Right. So the more that you can clear through the golf shot without spinning, I mean, it is still important to have that bump into the golf ball to shift momentum and then clear your hips. The more you're able to hit really solid crisp iron shots. Another good example of that on tour um, is someone like Dustin Johnson, right? Who he actually has what would be conventionally considered a hook swing at the top of his backswing, but he clears so effectively. Because the face is closed. Because the face is closed. He clears so effectively that he's able to maintain his face at impact as square, and he can do what most cause most people to hook while hitting a face. Yeah, you know what, Jake? Though uh, we'll talk about him another day. I, I, when you watch footage of Dustin John, he's got some other talents and some flexibilities that enabled him to hit the ball the way he does. So, um, but we'll deal with that another day. Yeah, I want to stick to Tommy Fleetwood. So the drill of the day today for all of you. And this is what Tommy did, and he went, I think he jumped up to strokes gain ball striking in 2018, up to 14th or 17th in the world uh, on tour when he did this, and he became a better ball striker, and it was a very simple drill with his coach. He kept his arms extended and just did half swings, so he turned his chest back to waist high and then turned his hips through and hit the ball, keeping his arms in front of him, very passive wrists, hands, and forearms. Uh, quietening them right down, actually trying to prevent them from moving, and just almost taking these robotic body-turning half swings. And it turned him into a, even a better ball striker. And the reason it did that is because that synchronizes the timing between the upper body and the lower body. It forces the body to work properly because the hands and arms are not flipping and saving anything. You're trying not to use them at all. And it really teaches the bottom half of the swing and how to keep that club face passive and neutral into the golf ball. So little half swings, everybody. Stand over the ball. Extend those arms as you normally would, but just feel like you maintain the extension in both arms. Turn back with the chest to waist high. Turn the hips through. Swing the club through to waist high on the other side. Hit a bunch of balls like that, and pretty soon you'll have that club more in front of you. 
Yeah, so, love Tommy Fleetwood. He will win. Of course, uh, he, of course, he'll win. I mean, it's a matter of, like you said, it's a matter of time. I, I think you know we tend to oversubscribe majors to players because we look at a player who's great and go, he'll win a major someday. And if you say that about too many players, you there's not that many. Majors. He will. He'll win. But a major I, I think I think Tommy could win multiple. I mean, he's a good enough ball striker to do it. He's been in the mix enough to do it. It's just a matter of time, and that's why. Yeah, I don't even want to have that conversation. He, he, I pick him in the pool. He's elite. He's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not even worried about that conversation. No. And and Paul Azinger, let's get into the TV thing here a little bit. Uh, ta- Paul Azinger, I like him. We need more opinion on air, and I like Johnny Miller for that reason. And you know, I, I like Paul Azinger, but Paul Azinger does two things I don't like. Number one, his hyperbole is ridiculous. I yeah. guarantee you he's never been more nervous over a putt. That kind of stuff is not good broadcasting, and I don't like it. And he does it a lot if you start listening to him, so I don't like that. The other thing is, and, and you know, we have to accept that as international fans, Canadians, uh, he's an incredibly proud American. His battles with Seve in the Ryder Cup are epic. This guy... I mean, he, he'd grab the flag and go running up the hill in, in war, it almost seemed. This guy's patriotic. He is all in on America and the PGA Tour and the Ryder Cup. And I just think, you know, when he makes statements like, you got to win on the PGA Tour, it's because he feels that way. Yeah, but you know what? I actually don't disagree with him. Uh, Tommy yeah, doesn't disagree so with him. So what do you think him. of Lee Westwood? So Lee Westwood is one... Dozens of times around the world, he's won in four decades. Mm-hmm. The the Euros have dusted the Americans in the Ryder Cup over the last two decades. Yes, and he says until you win on the PGA Tour, you haven't really done it. You know, and I'm going. I would take Lee Westwood's career ten times over Paul Azinger's. You know, that's my own opinion. Okay, well, so and and I actually agree with that statement, right? I don't think Colin Montgomery wasn't great because he never, as to use another example, because he never won on tour. Um. I do, however, think that there is something to the statement. I just don't. Th- I just don't agree with how far he goes in that regard. I actually, like I, I said, Tommy Fleetwood did say he has a quote saying that you're well, of not. Of course, I, I get it. One of the greatest and, players and until you win in America. I, I, I do think you have to win on the PGA Tour. And I totally agree with Azinger's comment that there are two things that make you choke: money and pressure. And he's totally right about that, or, or you know, whatever stage you're on, sure. however you want to phrase that. So I agree with what he said, but he did say it in a bit of a condescending, That's my problem with tone. It. That's my problem with it. And, and my and other problem with it. he's full of hyperbole, this guy. Well, that's a general comment about him. But about this comment, the other thing I said is it's also how he, like you said, it was the dismissiveness of how he said it, going that tour over there. Okay, I do agree with Azinger that Fleetwood probably has pressure to win on the PGA Tour. I don't agree with Azinger that winning on the European Tour is – less of a big deal when you're talking about Abu Dhabi versus Puerto Rico. Like, are you saying Tony Finau has a better career than Tommy Fleetwood because Tony Finau won at Puerto Rico or Tommy Fleetwood who won Abu Dhabi back to back was a, almost a clincher in the Ryder yeah. cup. Well, we agree. We agree on that. So I mean, we're all good. Uh, and it might surprise people to hear that. I like, I like Azinger. I, I like what he's bringing. I think Azinger is getting better. I think yeah. he's getting better. I like what he brings to the game. I don't like things about him, but I think he's good. Like I like Johnny Miller. What, Okay, the Peter Costas thing. So let's get into coverage on television. I, I think sure. you and I both agree. I, well, I don't. We haven't talked about it. I think NBC co- coverage is better than CBS's coverage. Yes. Uh, I don't find Faldo says much that intriguing. Uh, the David Faraday shtick w- with the Gary McCord shtick about the smart alecky little stuff. I'm a little tired of that. Although I do think humor in golf might be one of the things we need. Uh, and I do like David Faraday. I'm trying to figure out what it needs. Tell everybody maybe what Costas said in the No Laying Up interview he did uh, and, and your thoughts on whether you agree with some of the stuff or not. Yeah, I mean, the honest thing is Costas said a lot of different things, right? Um, but one, with regards to better TV coverage. Yeah, well, again, he said a lot of different stuff. Uh, the crux of the argument was that was two things. Uh, number one, that the, it's so expensive right now to produce the golf that they don't have enough cameras and they're kind of beholden to their capabilities on tour right now. Yeah, and that's something that you don't think about too much, but you got to give them that, right? Totally. And, however, my counterpoint to that a little bit. It's like when someone comes to our business here and says, you know what you should do here? It you should install uh, water misters at every bay. You should do this. You should do that. Well, 
Everything has a Who's financial for ramification yeah. for it, right? Um, uh, on the other side, though, and where I don't necessarily think that's a total fair cop out is so does NBC, right? He said Fox basically it's a loss leader for Good them. Good point. That Fox does so well with their coverage because they only do the one event and they go guns blazing for it to prove yeah, what I they don't can like do. It. I don't like Fox's uh, coverage. I, I like Brad Faxon. I don't like their coverage that much. Oh, interesting. Much, so. See, I, I I do like their coverage, but that's that's I don't preference. Think Joe probably. Buck's that good. He's not a real insider. I can tell Jake when a commentator is a true insider who lives and breathes it, and one who's just a commentator. Like I don't even like when Dan Hicks on NBC starts making comments about guys' lies and swings because he's probably a thirteen handicap. You know, you need expertise. Mm-hmm. That's true. Uh, so that's one thing I, agree with I that. think we need. I agree with that. So but, what cost to say that you agree with? Well, so the things that Costa said that I do agree with was that essentially uh, CBS needs to, or the tour needs to try to hold the networks less hostage, right? They need to be able to do their job because one of the things that has happened is the tour has this image of what they want their players to look like. And the Patrick Reed example is the perfect example of this, right? He does what a lot of people consider cheating. And Slugger White comes out and says he was the perfect gentleman twice. And the PGA Tour posts on social media a week later at the President's Cup of him basically referencing him cheating and says, oh, he's having fun with the fans. You love this Patrick Reed cheating thing. <laughs> no, no, but just use it as an example, right? I, I, I don't, we don't, we beat that to death. I don't need to get back yes, into that. Yes, you beat it. We know where you stand on that, which is okay, but. Uh, no, no, but let me. Very let me... good, very good point made that the PGA Tour maybe has too much influence on what's shown on television. So the problem is that they want everybody to be that class act, as it were, and everybody to be golf's perfect image. And I actually think that's part of where the TV coverage lacks. There's not enough personality and there's not enough of the there being some bad guys. Mm-hmm. Regardless of the. In Patrick stuff? Reed, bad guys, you mean? Or well, if it, people making funny comments on air? What do you mean by that? No, I mean Patrick Reed, bad, letting yeah. people be different, right? Apart from the cheating part, I actually <laughs> think Patrick Reed, if that incident Apart hadn't have che- happened. It was funny. Did you see he tweeted out, uh, I think Peter Costas can see my bank account from, from here, here or yeah. whatever. That was so, funny. But no, no, but like I said, I, I don't want to make this about that scandal again. But apart from that part of the scandal, which is clearly too far, Patrick Reed being a bit of a bad guy is actually good for the tour. But the tour doesn't want to promote them like that because the tour wants everybody to be clean and everyone be, mm-hmm. everybody to be proper. So between that problem yeah, and not then... Having, so the money, so less cameras, and then the PGA Tour having too much influence. Those are good excuses. Uh, one thing he said that I liked was that he'd like to see more shots. So you show a few leaders hitting, and then you show shot after shot after shot. And he said you can hear the club swinging. You can hear the, the sound of impact. You can watch all kinds of different guys hitting the ball. I thought that was a neat comment. We got to see more shots. This let's go to 14 where a guy's got a 12 footer, and we probably know if he's on the leaderboard. We don't know if he'll make it. If he's not really on the leaderboard, he's going to make it because it's the only reason they'd show the guy. So then, so the whole concept of lots of putting, and you know, and only showing guys who aren't on the immediate leaderboard if they make a bomb or chip in or something. Uh, I think they got to mix up how many shots they show and find a way to show more golf. So the question then becomes, are you okay with not all of it being live? Because we yeah, have to be. Yes, have to be. Because, you you know, you've had the comment that, uh, Although I think we've discussed. There should be a rule. The last 20 minutes are live following the last couple of groups in or whatever. Well, but of course. I have no problem. Well, there should be live At 4 o'clock on in. Saturday, them showing 27 different shots from all over the course and kind of even flashing up. So it was an idea he had. I'm not sure it's a winner. But it's at least an idea. I'll tell you what I would like, uh, and it might be different than what you'd like. The old white guys, you know, I mean, it's that thing, right? It's the old boys club. And that I disagree with Peter Costas on, where it's just all old guys, 70-year-olds commenting on. You've got to like me saying that as a millennial. I mean, we need younger people on there, maybe a different type of communication. I mean, what would appeal to you? Uh, to make it a little more hip and young? Uh, I, I think it's a mixture of different people, frankly. I don't think a couple of older, more experienced broadcasters I is agree. a bad thing. Yeah, we don't want backwards hats and yo, no, dude. But I, I do agree. I mean, there's a reason why right now my favorite golf broadcasting duo is Shane Bacon and Brad Faxon. 
Brad Faxon is a little older than the average tour player, but he he isn't he hasn't retired from the tour that long ago. He's a very good just post tour player commentator. Mm-hmm. He's very interesting in how he talks. Yep. He's clearly passionate about architecture, and he makes more of an effort to talk about that than most of the other players. So I learned something by listening to him as someone who is more of a golf pro from a swing yeah, playing perspective than an architecture perspective. And then Shane Bacon, who's a slightly younger voice who can both relate to the players but relate to the broadcasters better, yeah. the dynamic works. And I think that if we had some younger but good talent, mm-hmm. it would be a better thing. I don't want them just to throw young 25-year-olds in, just to throw young 25-year-olds in. But I also don't want them throwing Davis Love in, just to throw Davis Love in, because Davis Love clearly doesn't have enough TV experience to be inter- interesting at all. Okay, so a few things. Youth and diversity would be good. And by the way, I don't say old white guys, because I, I, I want a, a minority on television automatically, but... You know, here goes the U.S. presidency again. We've got Biden and Sanders and Trump. I mean, mm-hmm. it's the same old, same old, you know, so. Diversity just, gives you different perspectives. Love that. Which adds value. I love right? that, which yeah. I think is great. Youth, ageism gives you different perspectives, different ages. Sexism gives you different perspectives, different. I'm probably saying that wrong, but, you know, to have a female like Dottie Pepper is on now. To have a yeah. female You're saying voice the opposite of what you mean, but I know what you mean. Yeah, all those topics, right? When we yeah. talk about all those topics, they're all good. They diversify the coverage. My most, my most valued thing that I would like, though is more expertise in color. Now, I thought Peter Costas was pretty good at this. The yeah, ironically, thing, this is where he was the best. Yeah, the thing that separates golf from all other sports is we play golf. So you can't play better baseball with Kevin and Jay Kame because not a lot of people above high school play baseball or or better football with Kevin and Jay. You can do better golf with Kevin and Jay Kame because we play the sport. And my favorite color people in hockey, I'll use Gary Galley on Hockey Night in Canada as an example. He's a former player, and he gives in-depth uh, perspective when stuff's done. He doesn't just say, yeah, you're right, Bob, that, bo- that uh, puck went into the top corner. What a shot. You know, he says, you'll notice that he doesn't have tape on the toe of his stick. And so for that reason, the puck came off this way. Really intense stuff. And as a 30-year golf teacher and a lifelong pro and, and player, and yourself in the same boat, Jake, to give perspective on, you know, why things are happening and little subtleties on swings and everything, I think would be really intriguing. Now, you can't go too deep. We, you have to be careful who you're speaking to. You can't get, we can't talk gears, 3D motion capture stats on, on golfers in the middle of Saturday afternoon when, when my mom is watching. Yeah, I agree. That makes you got to be sense. a little careful. But you can really give astute commentary. And that's what I love about uh, Faxon. Faxon is one of the great putters of all time. And he's a little out of the box. And he's a little more of just a, uh, he uses his instincts to putt and to teach, right? It's not all about science and tech. Yeah, he and talks he really about a lot understands about it, right? Yeah. He understands it. So he's got really interesting things to say. So if we get some diversity out there, some youth, more shots, and a little bit more, you know, stuff to help us play better. I think that is really uh, what I'd be looking for. Yeah, I also think the last thing I would throw in there is uh, they got to show more bad shots, as silly as that sounds. Yeah, what know? do you mean by that? I, you said this to me midweek, so I've got a little inside into that comment. But tell me what you mean by that and where it came from. Yeah, well, so I actually, I mean, the thing that I've been thinking of this a little bit, but the thing that really made me solidify this opinion was actually listening to Max, Max Homa. He and Shane Bacon have a new uh, podcast called Get a Grip. And uh, he said, you know, a lot of tour players, we wish they'd show bad shots sometimes because a lot of the debate, especially with the distance and how easy the game's getting going on, is because people make assumptions based on what they see on TV about tour play. They don't actually understand how hard it is sometimes. And, you know, I think it was really interesting watching this week at the Honda because the course is so difficult that there were some bad shots and there was some risk taking and penalizing in the last group. But in average PGA Tour weeks, the guys are so good when they're winning, they're so on point, that they're not making a lot of big mistakes. Whereas other guys are blowing it out of the park yeah, well, and sculling shots. I mean, maybe not that severely, but slightly mishitting shots and doing things. <laughs> but, I mean, Sung J.M. did basically chunk a shot into the bunker coming in at the Honda. That was a choke. Right? That was more of a choke than Tommy Fleetwood, and so, he won the tournament. So... These things do happen, and I think that what happens when you watch golf is because they're only showing, like you said, the guys who are playing poorly but made the putt, so they showed the putt, or the best players playing that week, 
you don't actually see enough depth into the I game. I get that. I get that, and I get Max Homa saying that, and I shoot 78 some days. I get it. Some days you don't have it, and bad stuff happens, and golf is hard. But we don't watch sports to watch people do what we can do. And okay, I, I but- get his perspective. Hang on. His perspective there is that he'd like to show that because it would maybe take away from the golf is so easy, the equipment's too good comment. And he's right about that. But I don't tune into the NBA to watch a bunch of guys miss shots because basketball's hard. I, I tune in to watch, you know, to watch great players do incredible things. And, and that's, I think, where the focus should be. Okay, so I couldn't agree with that more, except... The problem is that you get to see the bad shots in the NBA. So let's use NBA as an example, right? From a three-point shooting perspective, if you're 30% on a three-point line, that's not weird, right? People will miss a lot of shots shooting from three, but they keep shooting. So when they make a big shot, you appreciate it more because you realize it's not that easy. When a tour player, all you see is the guys attacking pins and hitting it, you do not appreciate how good that shot was because you have no frame of reference for what could have happened, right? So I agree that they have to show more good shots than bad shots. I'm not saying show every bad shot. And some shots are stupid to watch. What's the point? Yeah. The guy's not in it. But if they showed a little more of that, I think it would give people more of an understanding of what more. they should expect. A little more. I don't think that's a big deal. I, I want better commentary. I want more insight. I want to understand how to play the game better. I want youthfulness and diversity. And I do want personality. I also agree. You you mentioned earlier that, you know, Davis Love. And now uh, Live From's putting in Justin Leonard, who... I mean, if you talk about more of a milk toasty, yeah, I don't know enough middle about America Justin guy. Well, I've been watching him. He's been on live from a little bit, you know, doing some coverage. Uh, you don't know until he gets the stage in the spotlight and starts battling with Brandel Chambly about how he'll do. So I don't want to condemn him before he even sh- shows up. So on the inverse, but I mean, Davis Love and Justin Leonard are not the two most interesting, fun personality rich guys that I would pick to go on to television coverage. No, but on the inverse, that's why I think Michelle Wee's so interesting. Michelle Wee could be very, very, very yeah. good. Now she could I mean, also not be great at this one thing, right? She might not be the best broadcaster. But Michelle Wee has a personality. She is a completely different voice from most of the people on there. And she's hitting most of the criteria we're talking about. She knows what she's doing and she's diverse from everybody else. Like she could be well, very they obviously interesting. liked her at the Solheim Cup. They're having her back. So last night I was watching the golf channel. And the um, they had guys from Club Champions. Now, I don't know if people have seen this, but Club Champion is a new l- chain of stores in the U.S. And a gal was on, uh, a female golfer was on there hitting balls, and the so-called expert was helping her into a net uh, to fit her into better clubs. Okay. And they gave an awful tip. I mean, it was just totally wrong. I've been fitting lie angle. I, I, I took a Henry Griffiths club fitting course back in 1988 and had my first dynamic lie angle test where you put a little tape on the bottom of the golf club, you hit the golf ball off some kind of a splash pad, a plexiglass pad, and you see if the club is too upright because the mark's in the heel or too flat because the club's down in the toe, Mm -hmm. right? So I've been doing this since 1988. This fellow last night on television, on national television, uh, the girl hit the golf ball and the mark, her impact mark, her face mark, was too much in the heel. So he gave her, made the club more upright. And then her lie angle mark, which was pretty good on the first shot, was in the heel. And he said, that's better because, look, your your mark on the face is better. And he, he basically fit her into a more upright club. And so I, they're using... I was aghast. Yeah. They're using face position, impact position on the face to kind of dictate. But here's the thing. You need to start almost every club fitting session with lie angle and get your lie angle in the middle of the golf club with every club in your set because there's a there's an actual correlation between the golf ball going left and right sideways based on the club being off. If it's too upright, let's say you're right-handed and the heel's down, the toe's up, the ball will go left. If the toe is down, the heel's up, the ball will go right. You need to have a great lie angle. For him to say on national television, your mark's a little in the heel, but that's actually better in this case. I cannot buy into that. So that just got my ears perked up like crazy. You know, it was such a bad comment. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a uh, perpetual issue with swing and club fitters, right? Um, what does that so, mean? Well, for, so for people to understand what I'm talking about here, first off, the reason why the ball takes off at different angles 
when the line goes wrong is because your loft is inherently tilted. So when the toe is up, the loft has been tilted more to the left. So you're going to have more of a left starting line than you would have, or, or yeah. towards your starting yeah. line for a left-handed player. I just said that. No, I know, but I'm just explaining why that's the case, right? So if you are hitting a shot where the loft is tilted, you're going to have to adjust your swing to hit it straight, right? You're going to have to change your swing. What some club fitters do is they don't think about that when they're fitting you, and they're just trying to get maximum results in the instant. In that case, making your club more upright can make you hit more in the middle of the face. You might hit it more square, so he goes, problem solved, you're hitting or, the ball better. said another way, he doesn't know what he's doing, and that when you're getting club fit, you need to also take the swing into account. This is where I jump on the highest soapbox possible as a PGA pro and a teacher and a fitter to tell everybody who will listen that it's an equa- your ball striking is an equation between your equipment and your swing. And you cannot go to a sales rep who only looks at getting that club to go a little better for you that day, who doesn't take into account swing motion, uh, the plane of the club into the golf ball, and everything about the timing and golf swing, including your posture, including path of the club, including face angle at impact. And if you don't understand the golf swing, it's very difficult to get that done. So when people go into a shopping mall and get fit from someone who's not a golf pro, who's just maybe reading data coming off a computer, you know, I get... They're missing a big part of it. Oh, my goodness. I, I get really frustrated at that. And and we as golf professionals should be more maybe outspoken about this, that you need to... Un, if your fitter doesn't understand the golf swing and where you're, the path of your club, the shape of your swing, the attack angle... All of those things, as you're making impact, they all come into, you know, how the computers are reading that, that actual shot, how the tape is looking on the golf club. So it's golf swing and golf club. And you really should be taking club fitting sessions or getting your club fit by someone who, who understands the golf swing and maybe even even better understands your swing because you've taken a few lessons with you, Jake, maybe. And by the fourth lesson, you say, let's look at your irons and try a few different ones out, right? Well, that's what I was getting at, right? Which is when you make the line go wrong to get the desired shot, your swing is going to suffer, right? I mean, another example of that is we, you know, people talk about how, well, if you make the club more upright, you'll draw the ball more. No, you won't. You'll hit it left because the club doesn't suit you. And that's also why it's so important for people to get their line angles checked. Yeah. I think a lot of people think of it as an afterthought. They go, especially because, you know, we don't discuss driver lie angle because there's so little loft in a lie angle that when you tilt the loft differently, it doesn't have a major effect. Um, People don't think about it, but it's important to have your lie angles checked, as you say, from a golf pro, because if you have a bad lie angle, you will adjust your swing. And then all of a sudden you're trying to fix your swing and you can't and you don't figure out why. Yeah, so we tell the story. So, So here it is. If your clubs are too flat. So. If you swing off a dynamic lie board and the mark is out on the toe, that means your golf club is flat. Yes. All right. So when that happens, the golf ball will want to, as you say, the face is adjusted, want to go to the right. Agreed. You will subconsciously start swinging a little out to in and down at the ball to pull the ball back to the left. So you'll develop some kind of an outside in downward path. And what I would say is it's a pull move. So if if I stand up there, with a golfer and he's got a pull and then I do a lie angle chest check on his clubs and the clubs are flat. You know, the next thing you do is you get him into a more upright golf club. And then when he makes that pull move, the ball goes left. So even more a poorly, left, yeah. a poorly fit golf club for lie angle will actually encourage a worse swing. And this is where I, I really have a problem with a salesman fitting someone and a salesman who doesn't look and say, well, why does this person have a pull move, right? Let's check their golf clubs out and, and blend it all in. And maybe a little bit of work on the club path and how the person swings the golf club has to factor into the whole lie angle conversation, right? So bottom line is do your due diligence, get fit, hopefully outside where you can see actual ball flight, feel the wind in your face, see your ball flying, and do it with a golf pro who understands you know, maybe these adjustments you're making in your balance, maybe your alignment's terrible because your lie angles are really bad and your way to fix uh, those crooked golf shots based on a poor lie angle is to adjust your aim, right? You've got to look at it all. You can't not just look at 
tape on a club and say, oh, let's do this to your club. Uh, in essence, I would argue that by fitting someone with a bad swing into a club that suits that bad swing, they're going to encourage that compensation to keep happening. So it's a really interesting conversation there. Uh, it's not complicated if you've got a good fitter who's a pro who can help you out. Uh, but you need that knowledge. And, uh, you know, you just can't separate out the golf swing and the, and the golf club. You have to look at the whole equation. So just be careful where you get fitted. No, that's... Uh couldn't agree with all that more. And to that point, that's also why you should every now and then check your lie angles. Get them checked fairly regularly. Yeah, they do move, right? Clubs can move. Not only can clubs move, but your swing can slightly change it. So you're going to tend to be in a range that's not going to change that much over time because the way that your body is structured and your swing is structured, you're, you're going to be in a, a wheelhouse. I've been one flat for uh, a, more than a decade. I mean, yeah. it hasn't changed even but though the swing It may changes. not be your swing changing too much. It might be that... You know, maybe your clubs just after a lot of impacts, they de-loft a little. They move a little no, bit. No, no, right? but... So you got to be careful of that sure. as well. And I'm saying, especially... If, but even if your swing is changing, you might need to get it checked too. Because depending on how you are imparting force on the shaft, which in theory changes with a different golf swing, a better golf swing, you might need a different lie angle, right? One of the reasons why we talk about dynamic lie angle and making sure you test your lie angles, you don't just get measured on a chart and say, this is my lie angle for sure, is because when you swing, clubs bend. Right? When you impart force on a shaft, the club bends down, and we call that droop, and that's going to affect your lie angle. And if you change your golf swing, you you're right. Might if be you're improving and force. swinging faster, especially juniors, people who are really accelerating, beginners who are getting better and better, you might need a different lie angle by the time you're done. Really interesting. So it's just one of those things that if you check it every now and then, it's a, it's a huge positive. And you're right. When you get it checked and when you get it fit, make sure your swing's part of the equation because if it's not, you're you're robbing yourself of the proper equipment. Yeah, you know, I, I think PGA pros, uh, whether in Canada, America, Europe, we're not teaching and educating enough from that perspective. We're allowing the golf club sellers, we're allowing the stores to kind of take too much ownership of this part of the game. And, you know, the real reason you need a PGA pro anyway is to either teach you how to – how to hit a club, to watch them hit a club, to help you fit a club. It's back to that color commentary on TV, that deep understanding of the game. And it's so much better for the average player to get fit by someone who can, you know, really understand where their path is based on their swing, where they even are on their learning arc, right? We'll sometimes say to a pupil, you don't want to get fit for clubs yet. Give me two months and four time. lessons and, and then we'll fit you because I think you've got a lot of speed in the tank. So, where you are right now with a few lessons in practice you're going to be miles from here in two months so let's not fit you today there won't be a salesman in the world who will say that to you they'll just say yeah these clubs are great they're on sale of course so i i think it's just a a message that i really want to give people that uh pay attention to your equipment watch who you're listening to and lie angle is so critical and actually affects not only ball flight, but the way you swing the golf club. So simple little test, Jake. I mean, we do it all the time. We, we go through rolls and rolls of black electric tape at our golf school. Lots. And plexiglass plates to hit balls off. You just basically put a little strip of black electric tape on the bottom of your club, hit it off a hard surface, and see where the scuff is. Scuff's in the toe, club's flat. Scuff's in the heel, club's upright. There's a little more in-depth to it. We're looking for a football shape in the middle of the sole. To, to show that the that golf club grounded out property relative to its bounce and its design. And, you know, there's a little bit more to it than that. But basically, to see heel-toe, uh, you just have to scuff the club and kind of figure out what's going on there. And it, it's very, very important to get it done. All right, let's, let's wrap that topic up. Last topic of the day, uh, favorite teaching aids. Yes. Did you come up with one, or are we just doing mine today? Oh, I got a lot. I got a lot. But I came up with one uh, specifically based on the conversation we had with John Rahm. Um, one of the things that I think is completely undervalued is getting the ball close to the hole on a, on a long putt, right? I think the reason why we point that out a lot to people is because that distance control thing is not something that people think about much. What's the aid? Tease. My teaching aid is tease around the green. <laughs> And I know that sounds ridiculous, and most of my a little lame. No, 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 not lame. Hold on. <laughs> Mo most of most of the time when we talk teaching aids, we're going to talk about a product, right, that you can go buy. But I think this one is invaluable. If you get tees or coins or a ball marker, and you put ladder drills up on a green for you, 
it is an invaluable teaching tool that not enough people do. You know, not a lot of people practice their putting. And all of them practice their putting because they feel like they're just hitting a butt to a hole and they don't really know what they're working on. But if you can gamify a little bit and you can make something happen, not only does it get more interesting, but your putting practice will get more productive. So let me explain what I mean by a ladder drill. Okay, so what I want everybody to do is the next time you're practicing your putting, I want you to take about 10 tees out to the practice screen and pick a hole. And behind the hole, I want you to make a semicircle of tees or about a three foot range. Okay, so that gives you the back ring of kind of where you want your putts to end up. Okay, then you're going to pace off 10 steps, 20 steps, and 30 steps. And each time you pace off a 10 step, I want you to put a tee in the ground. And those are going to be your starting points. Then take three golf balls and try to hit three putts from the 10-foot tee, the 20-foot tee, and the 30-foot tee, either into the hole or into the ring. You don't want it short because you want the putt to have a chance to go in. And you want it within that three-foot ring because that basically can guarantee a two-putt if you're a good short putter. And don't leave until you can make three either in the hole or in the circle from all three distances. Yeah, that's fine, Jake, but that's a drill. That's not even an aid. I mean, setting tees up different ways, that that to me is more of a drill, and it's a great drill. Sure, but I want to pr have people start understanding the perception of what a teaching it is, right? I don't think a teaching it is only something you buy. I think there's lots of well, that I couldn't agree great more. ones out there. But if you understand that it's what you do with a teaching it that's important, not what the teaching it apparently is, because way too many people rush out to just buy an arbitrary teaching it because it was on the golf channel and yep. it was endorsed by this guy. Totally agree I with that. Using, using a water bottle, using one of your alignment sticks, using tees, as you just said, and some kind of a ladder drill for working on your pace while you're putting. Those are all uh, great messages. Yeah. So I know we're going to talk a lot about yeah. teaching aids over the next year, and we're going to do it. But I'm starting out of B the box minus. right away. I'm giving you a B minus. Well, on fair that enough. One. I like where I'm starting. All right. I'll have I'll have I'll have Here's more mine. Of a solid one next. Here's time. mine. I've got a little uh, strap in my hands, and uh, I don't know how do we describe that, Jake? It's called an Izzo strap, but I know Figure Eight make one. Yeah, there's lots of there's uh, lots iterations of, of it. Basically, it's a tensor bandage that's about what a foot across. It's tight elastic stuff, and you put your two arms inside of it. So you mount this strap onto your arms. Uh, and you slide it up just to the elbows. I would say right on the elbows or just below the elbows. Agreed. And, of course, there's a lot of pressure to keep your arms together then. So the strap is basically designed to keep your arms together, and it's designed to keep them in front of you. And if we go all the way back to the start of our podcast, talking about Tommy Fleetwood maintaining arm extension as he rotated his chest back, this aid is the best one out there, I think, to do that. I, th I think it's about 15 bucks. Again, I like your thinking on not spending too much money. This one's pretty inexpensive. But it's just a little tensor bandage wrapped around your elbows to keep them together, and it, t it tends to keep your arms more in front of you as you swing. The bonus to it, and you talked about flipping earlier on the show, if your body's not moving, it's much more difficult when you've got your arms bound together like this to rotate your forearms and flip your wrists in your hands and to save the shot. So it tends to encourage what we talked about in Tommy Fleetwood, which is keeping the club in front of you and keeping uh, the chest moving, right? And, and using the big muscles and keeping the swing more neutral and everything. It's a wonderful teaching aid. A uh, couple extra little things it does at the top of your swing. It kind of forces your elbows to stay together and a little bit more pointed at the ground, which is... I think an absolute super thing, you know, so it's got that element to it as well. And then, uh, you know, I think back, I guess the same thing, just talking about keeping those elbows together a little more than natural. I think back to my old days of reading Hogan's Five Lessons, The Modern Fundamentals of Golf, back written in 1957. And he talked about wrapping yarn around his forearms to keep them, That's to have visual. a sense of keeping them together throughout the entire swing. So this little $15 tensor strap, uh, is my teaching aid of the of the podcast. Okay, so let me double down on mine being tees. The other thing you can do with the Izzo strap, which is a fantastic teaching aid, is put one of those tees at the, in that plug at the butt of your grip. Because one of the things we're talking about with Tommy Fleetwood is not only keeping your arms in front of you and turning, but keeping your hands quiet. And so if you also put a T in the butt of the grip, when you have that Izzo strap on, it's very easy to see how that T is going to intersect your two arms. You're going to see that. And as you practice the Izzo strap, turning your chest and swinging back with your arms in position, make sure the T stays in between your wrists, stays in between your arms. If 
with the strap on, you add hand movement, you're not really doing the drill properly anyway. So by putting that T in there, it's a kind of a add-on like like to the Izzo strap to do exactly what Tommy Fleetwood was trying to do with his arm staying extended and just turning his chest. Actually, through the entire swing, uh, li- listeners, viewers, if you have a T in the vent hole at the end of the club, and as you stand over the ball and you start swinging both ways, that that T should remain in between your forearms through the entire golf swing, all the way up to the top. If you look, you can see it. It'll, it'll be a little closer to your lead arm at that point, but you should still be able to see that T. And through the entire golf swing, that center of your grip cap, the butt end of the golf club should stay between your forearms. So, all right, there I'm you still go, giving you a B minus. I mean, you got to come with better stuff. Now. It's a drill segment. Tees. Next, you're going to say nickels. Nickels are great. I mean, you got to bring something. This this strap is fantastic. The I win. Is, fantastic. I win. is that a contest? I win. Sure. Yeah. Let's make it a contest. I like. That. All right. I want to finish the podcast with one little story. It's Bay Hill Week. Yes, and, it is. Uh, I, I've been down, played it a few times. I actually worked with a young junior down there and s- stayed on site with a buddy. One of the great weeks of my life, spending a few days hanging out in the clubhouse. This young junior got an autograph from Mr. Palmer when he was still alive. I think it was about four years ago. Uh, so he cherishes that. And it's so cool because Arnold's signature is really shaky, which, you know, is towards the end of his life. And it's so authentic. You know, I mean, there's no way someone stamped it onto the visor. It is so cool to have that that cherished little piece of memorabilia. But Arnold, nobody has signed more autographs for Arnold. Nobody has done more for anyone going up to them signing an autograph. So I just think it's so neat to have that. Anyway, I spent the week at Bay Hill. And the coolest thing that happened to me, I'm going to give you two things. Uh, One is an irrelevant one, but we played in the cold one day. And at Bay Hill, they serve a wicked chili on the golf course. And this is how detailed Arnold Palmer is about the details at his club when he was at the helm. We talk about, you know, or everyone talks about running a great facility and little things to do. He had a a wax cup, and he put the chili in the wax cup. So you got this nice, tall, little cup of chili, but it fit in the cup holder in the cart. Got it. So you talk about a detail. You go, well, how would you serve chili on a golf course? You're going to have this bowl. It's going to be really messy. Arnold even figured out how to, you know, serve it so that you could take it on the back nine with you. So if you're ever at Bay Hill in lousy weather, everyone, have the chili at the turn. That's not my main point I want to finish up with, though. My main point I want to finish up That's with. That's not your best tip of the whole show? Many te- Well, it's better than teas, I think. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that again. Um, Arnold Palmer, in his 80s. Yes. I go by his bag on his electric cart. He was down in the locker room playing cards with his friends. And I check out his golf bag, and he's got, like, multiple drivers in the golf bag. Arnold, even at that age, is trying to eke out a couple more yards. I mean, to me, that's the most fascinating, awesome, pure thing about why he is the king and why we celebrate the MasterCard at Bay Hill and why Rory McIlroy shows up and everything. This guy... Love golf so much that in his 80s, he was testing drivers to gain like an extra, you know, imagine at the point of his age where he was probably hitting the golf ball 130 off the tee, but he's testing clubs to try to eke out every yard he could. And I just think that represents him so well and what's so great about the sport. You know, we talked earlier about everyone can play golf and we can relate to that. That's why our podcast is called Better Golf. You know, you talk about that and... Here is the uh, the king of golf, you know, trying to hit a ball a little bit farther with one driver or whatever. So I'll be watching a lot of Bay Hill this week. This leads up to the Masters, of course. It's an exciting time in golf, spring in golf, and I'm uh, I'll, I'll be fired up. I think Rory's going to win this week. Do you? Yeah, do you? I do. Un- unfortunately, we can't have a Francesco Molinari repeat because he just pulled out because of, of a back injury. But I think Rory's a good. I'd love pick. to see Tommy Fleetwood win too. We we broke down his golf swing a little bit today. I would love to see Tommy Fleetwood. I just don't think Bay Hill suits him perfectly. It's not as much of a flight the ball golf course. It's it's almost a little easier, which brings a lot more guys into it, which makes it harder for some of those ball striker purists to win if they're not hot with their putting. Well, he doesn't hit the ball high. I think you're right about that. So Rory's got that advantage. Tiger Woods won eight times. Bring a lot of guys in. The elite always rise to the top. uh, Rory's an elite player, is the elite player in the world probably right now. Fleetwood's in that. Where's Fleetwood in your, uh, he's in my top eight for sure. He may not be one, two, or three. I think he's even top five. I I really like Tommy Fleetwood a lot. Going into last week, I know he was 13th in the world, but I perceive him as a top 10 player. Uh, as well, 
Um, I, like I said, I just think that there's a little bit of him getting over some of the last yeah, round Yeah, yeah, he's going to prove you wrong. After he does that, then, uh, yeah, I, th I think he's a top five Good player. Good job in the world. today. Good job. We'll be watching, and uh, let's hope the TV coverage is a little better. Yeah, let's do it. We'll talk to everybody again in our next episode or next podcast. Great.